So hello, everybody. Welcome to our 13th sleep salon, our first live salon. Um, my name is Alana Thane. Uh, unfortunately, Will Straw could not be here with us today, um, along with Alex Kaminska, I'm co-director of Sociability of Sleep. And um, we're extremely excited for today's event, but I'm first going to begin with a land acknowledgement that the Sociability of Sleep is physically located in Dodagi, Munyang, Montreal, which is situated on the traditional and unceded territories of the Ganyakahaga and that we recognize with gratitude that they are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, live, and rest. Jojage, Montreal, Monyang has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganyagahaga, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wandat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabeg peoples. And I'll also share an acknowledgement developed by the Feminist Media Studio that while Zoom, a company that has exploded in value during pandemic forms of assembly, um, is the technical custodian of the platform on which we're gathering. This makes us no less occupants of the multiple territories on which we are physically located. Zoom's headquarters are located on Mwekma Ohlone territory, and the Ohlone have historically understood about sustainability, communal society, and giving gifts to those who pass by. Now we see Zoom as a platform which connects us, but also alienates us from the aims of restitution, justice, and reparation. And I think these are going to be questions that we're going to be exploring at some depth in the salon for today. So uh, lastly, I'll just acknowledge that the Sociability of Sleep is supported by funding from the Government of Canada's New Frontiers in Research Fund. And on the SOS website, you can sign up for our newsletter, find out more about upcoming events such as future sleep salons, conferences, our final exhibition, which now has a name, which is Ensemble uh, taking place in Montreal this summer in June and July, and that you should reach out if you're interested in learning more or collaborating, we have two calls for papers also up on our website as well. So thanks for taking your time to be here. During the salon, please feel free to use the chat to share thoughts, comments, and relevant links. And we'll have a Q&A after our two speakers who are each gonna speak for about 20 minutes. I turn now to our speakers and I'm very excited to introduce Jean Ma. Jean has published books on the temporal poetics of Chinese cinema, Melancholy Drift, Marking Time in Chinese Cinema, Singing Women on Film, Sounding the Modern Woman, the Songstress in Chinese Cinema, and the Relationship of Cinema and Photography, Still Moving Between Cinema and Photography. She's the co-editor of Music, Sound, and Media, a book series at the University of California Press. Her writing has appeared in Camera Obscura, Criticism, Film Quarterly, Ray Room, Journal of Chinese Cinema, and October. At Stanford University, she's the Victoria and Roger Sant Professor in Art, Area Director of Film Media Studies and the Dunning Family Di Director of the Stanford Arts Institute. And her recent and wonderful book, At the Edges of Sleep, Moving Images and Somnolent Spectators can be accessed online in an open source digital edition. So please join me in welcoming Jean Bon. Thank you, Alana. Um, thanks to Alana and Alex for um, inviting me to be here. It's actually really wonderful to be here in person at McGill. Um, thanks also to Charlene and Josiane for getting me here. And um, this is really exciting because I've been following the sleep salons with great interest ever since they launched in 2021. Um, the previous salons featured many guests whose work I encountered and thought about in the process of writing at the edges of sleep, including Amara Tabor-Smith and Ellen Sebastian Chang, two incredible artists and my colleagues at Stanford who were guests of salon number six last winter. Those of you who attended will recall that Amara and Ellen spoke about Houseful of Black Women a multi-site, multimedia, and multi-authored performance project that has been ongoing since 2015, driven by this core question. How can we, as Black women and girls, find space to breathe and be well within a stable home? In the spring of 2019, I attended one of the episodes of their project entitled Black Women Dreaming Divine the Darkness. It consisted of an interactive installation at the Asharo Ekundayo Gallery in downtown Oakland, created by the artists Alexa Burrell, Shelley Davis Roberts, and Stephanie Johnson, 
along with a private durational ritual at an undisclosed location. For seven consecutive days, this location was transformed into a space dedicated entirely to the dreams, sleep, and rest of Black women, with participants joining on a rotating basis throughout the week. This durational ritual was accompanied by an opening and closing ceremony and other events and workshops. My presentation today will center on an account of Black women dreaming Divine the Darkness based on my attendance at several of the public facing events as a witness and participant. This account is intended as a tribute to the inspiring work of the Houseful Collective. Along with continuing the, the conversation that started in the previous salon and offering another perspective into their work, I wanted to share what I learned from this experience. The, the sleep ritual made a deep impression on me as, and I kept going back to it in the process of writing as I grappled with one of the book's big questions. In what ways has sleep been invested with political significance in recent years? And how might a politics of sleep be articulated? Black Women Dreaming provides a powerful Black feminist response to these questions. In the process of doing so, it also touches on private versus public divisions that frame the act of sleep, which will hopefully relate to some of the topics discussed by Caracello today. To set the stage, I'll begin with a description of the opening ceremony the blessing of the beds at the Sharo Ekundayo Gallery that initiated the episode. Several members of the collective spoke at this event, Tabor Smith, Sebastian Chang, and Amber McZeal. And this is what they said. Here I'm channeling and synthesizing their words. Firstly, capitalism tells us that work is the sole source of all value, meaning, and worth. In response, we assert the value of our lives regardless of productivity. We are insisting on the right to sleep as part of a project of refusal and revolution, rebuilding the strength of our bodies and our communities. We understand our rest as our resistance. Second, we insist on the right to sleep in this place, in this independent art space surrounded by newly constructed office buildings and condominiums in a neighborhood and city that has seen the displacement of large numbers of residents by rampant gentrification. Sleep is an act of not only taking power, but also reclaiming place. This is not about our desires, it is about our needs. And what we need is clean air and water, stable housing and sleep. Third, nothing in the society encourages Black women to rest and sleep better, so we are going to have to teach ourselves. After their remarks, the attendees gathered in a ritual of meditation led by Gina Breedlove to send a message of ease to those involved in the private ritual of sleep taking place elsewhere. By this means, a larger circle of participants was called upon to engage indirectly with the inner circle of sleepers, contribute to the web of support sustaining the circle, and express solidarity with the collective's political message. This political message is one that resonates widely in the current landscape. For instance, the assertion that our rest is our resistance lies at the center of the NAP ministry, founded in 2016 by Tricia Hersey on the basis that, quote, we believe rest is a form of resistance and name sleep deprivation as a racial and social justice issue. Recently, Hersey published the Nat Ministry's manifesto seen here. Like Houseful, Hersey calls upon sleep as a disidentification from the capitalist ethic of work. Black Power Naps, Siestas Negras, an installation and initiative by the Afro-Latinx artists Naviot Acosta and Fanny Sosa, 
addresses sleep deprivation as part of racial capitalism's legacy of extraction. The initiative aims for, quote, the redistribution of rest, relaxation, and downtimes, drawing a connection between the repair of bodies and historical reparations. For a discussion of both of these projects, see the article Rest Notes on Black Sleep Aesthetics by Josie Rowling Hudson. Experiments in Supine Possibilities was an event organized in 2020 by the Church of Black Feminist Thought, based in the East Bay and founded by Ra Malika Imotek and Miyuki Baker. Participants were invited to engage in seven days of lying down and heeding the messages or silences of your body at rest. Experiments in supine possibilities takes its cue from the Kambayi River Collective by asking, how might we use our position at the bottom to make a leap, a clear leap into revolutionary action? A statement of purpose can be found on their website and I'll just read some of it here. This is an experiment in embodying the rhetorical position of the bottom, asking what if instead of fighting for center, we force a reorientation towards the bottom? Or what if we don't force anything, we build from here, allowing our backs something to rest on, training our eyes beyond the ceiling, roof, clouds, cosmos. Laying on the back refuses to offer it up as a bridge. Supine Possibilities is an attempt at weaving together Harriet Tubman's hypersomnia and Breonna Taylor's stolen sleep. How do we complicate our notions of rest and individualist practices of retreat? Supine Possibilities invites slow contemplation of these questions through shared acts of intention around laying down and recording of dreams, thoughts, feelings, and curiosities upon rising. It invites participants to see what happens when you fully avail yourself to the messages or silences of your body at rest. Indeed, in the 21st century, the supine body has assumed a strikingly prominent position in the corporeal lexicon of mass protest. From the die-ins organized by the Movement for Black Lives, such as you see here, to the encampments of the worldwide Occupy movement. On the left is Wall Street 2012, on the right is Hong Kong 2014. The Egyptian writer Haitham El Wardani, discussing the revolutionary demonstrations in Tahrir Square that launched the Arab Spring, writes, sometimes the simple act of sleeping there in the square was the most eloquent political statement. Sleeping while occupying is the true heart of occupation, unquote. Alongside the familiar militant postures of rising up and standing up, which draw upon what the philosopher Adriana Cavarero has identified as a conception of agency fully captive to a vertical geometry of rectitude, another gestural repertoire, one oriented to the horizontal line, has entered the frame of political struggle. Sleeping in public comes to embody a disruption of business as usual and, in the words of Anna Della Subin, a stance against injustice that is not only nonviolent, but as vulnerable and non-cooperative as possible. In many of these instances, as sleep moves from the private sphere into the public, it is recoded as a collective activity imbued with social and political import. In tension with the logic of a booming market in sleep enhancing products, sleep sheds its associations with individualized self-care in the service of the neoliberalist mandate of optimizing the self. The politics of sleep also calls into question longstanding definitions of sleep as an inward term, radical solitude, or an act of severing from the web of intersubjective exchanges. To sleep in the presence of others is to willingly abandon the fiction of self-sufficiency and autonomy 
an acknowledgement of vulnerability and interdependence. Those who sleep are unable to see themselves and must be watched over by others, consigned to the protection of those who are awake. The lesson about Tahrir Square derived by Judith Butler is that sleeping in public puts the body on the line and thereby sounds a call to reorganize the social world in a manner that can safeguard the basic needs of that body. Black Women Dreaming Divine the Darkness secures the protection of its sleepers through the design of a collective situation shaped in the participatory and performative framework of ritual. But even while it reflects the horizontal orientation of a politics of vulnerability, it also takes a deliberate step back from the tactics of exposure and visibility mobilized in these other examples. It refrained from putting supine sleeping bodies on the line and into public view. Instead, the communal event of slumber remained hidden from view behind a curtain of privacy, while being publicized indirectly and by degrees of remediation. In its careful balancing act of disclosure with reserve, Black Women Dreaming short-circuited the dynamics of visual confrontation and witnessing that public sleeping sets into play. In so doing, Black Women Dreaming raises important questions about the ways that exposure might not enable, but rather hinder a reparative Black feminist politics of sleep. Contained in this reserve is a caution. If access to rest is unevenly and inequitably distributed, so sleep should not be idealized as a gateway into a common biologically leveled humanity. I should note that Tabor Smith refers to the racial sleep gap in connection with the project. Black Americans are the most sleep deprived demographic in the US. Sleep deprivation was used historically by enslavers as a means of forcing compliance among enslaved people. Even vulnerabilities that are shared by all weigh upon different bodies to different degrees. Vulnerability is allowed to or imposed upon disparate groups in varying measures. A turn to a counterexample provides an entry into Black Women Dreaming's navigation of such concerns. Integrating the activity of slumber as part of a choreographed event, the project evokes other contemporary performances that involve sleep. For instance, one recent work that sits squarely within what might be called a performance art of sleep is The Maybe by artist Cornelia Parker and actor Tilda Swinton, in which the slumbering body is presented in accord with the art museum's traditional methods of display and in conformity with a longstanding iconography of the aesthetically idealized female figure. At the first exhibition of this piece in 1995, Swinton slept inside a large glass vitrine in the Serpentine Gallery, the unconscious woman placed on exhibit as a precious object. Swinton kept up this performance for eight days, for eight hours a day during second consecutive days, matching the duration of Black women dreaming. Swinton's feet calls to mind a host of other works that have similarly engaged sleep as part of an extreme performance that overwrites its associations with ease and rest, recoding it in terms of endurance and discipline. The tightrope of extreme inertia and superlative willpower upon which she balances calls to mind Chris Burden's 1972 bed piece in which the artist lay on a bed in a gallery for 22 consecutive days. Says Burden, quote, I wanted to force the gallery staff to deal with me by presenting myself as an object, but I'm not an object, so there'd be this moral dilemma. The body on the line is simultaneously caught up in a precarious balancing act between personhood and objecthood, suspended between a recessive subjectivity and an object status to which the human body cannot be reduced, as Burden confidently asserts. Notwithstanding its performative dimension, 
Black Women Dreaming disengages from this strand of heroic sleep performance. Along with the mythos of individual exceptionalism into which it feeds, and the institutionalized aesthetic economies upon which it relies. It raises the crucial question of whether the wager of objecthood so boldly assumed by the performance artist merits the risk for those subject to techniques of racialization that systematically deprive them of the status of personhood. If the question of race hovers only at the margins of the maybe and bed piece, it is central to Black women dreaming. Sleep must be protected, but what about the sleep of those for whom social protections do not reliably function in the first place, such as the Black women and girls whose well being constitutes the main impetus for Houseful of Black Women? Consider the example of Lola Simba, Sim, Siondola, a graduate student at Yale University who in 2018 was subject to an interrogation by four police officers as a result of taking a nap in the common room of her dormitory during an all-nighter. Despite widespread university efforts to address sleep deprivation in the student population, which extend to the creation of napping zones in libraries, dorms, and other campus spaces at many schools, Sion Bola's nap was met with a charge of criminality. Even more disturbing is the example of Brianna Taylor, shot dead by police while at home in her bed, echoing a history of civil rights leaders killed by police at night in their beds. The targeting of Black Americans by systems of surveillance and state violence nullifies the sanctity of sleep, along with any meaningful distinction between private and public. It is precisely because Black female subjects are not granted social, cultural, or legal privacy, Jennifer Nash writes, that the private becomes for them a site of self-cultivation, opposition, and potential liberation. In response to unremitting exposure to the policing gaze, Black women have historically developed practices of dissemblance, fugitivity, opacity, and invisibility for the purposes of securing safety and, in Nash's words, quote, the sanctity of an inner life. These practices demand a rethinking of default distinctions between the public as the realm of political action and the private as apolitical, as well as between active and passive resistance. Black Women Dreaming assumes a position in this lineage of practices carving out a commons of sleep that is also an enclosure or a space in which bodies are at once held and withheld. Its politics are informed by the Black feminist concept of the retreat. Defined by Tina Kempt as a strategy of inward escape, a place to dream of possibility from within impossible strictures, and a transformation that begins in the dark. Turning to sleep as a mode of incubation, Black Women Dreaming taps its liberatory powers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker while we do a little switcheroo on the, the PC. Our next speaker is Kara Chalou, who is a public space researcher, writer, and founder of Defensive Tio, 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 a multimedia project that documents defensive hostile urbanism in Toronto and beyond. She's currently doing a PhD in urban planning policy and design at McGill University, where she's exploring the planning design and governance of public space through a lens of inclusion and exclusion. Kara is a member of the Urban Politics and Governance Research Group at McGill and a research assistant with the Shirk funded project Nighttime Design for and with marginalized communities. Passionate about all things public space, Kara is also an organizer with the Toronto Public Space Committee and a volunteer with the Planners Network. And her work has been published in Azure, the Canadian Journal of Urban Research, and Spacing Magazine. 
Thanks for being with us, Kelly. Thank you so much. And, and, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, just going to ensure that I'm all set up here. Excellent. We all know that sleep is necessary. Anyone who works during the night or cares for young children knows that the lack of sleep can affect physical, mental, and emotional health. This can include impacts like increased blood pressure and a higher risk of accidents, trouble concentrating and, and mood changes. But sleep is also a luxury, especially for people who are homeless or precariously housed. While some unhoused people access emergency shelter space, many rely on public space to meet their basic needs, like sleeping, using the washroom, and finding food and other resources. Lacking private space of their own, access to public spaces like parks, streets, sidewalks, and squares is critical for survival. In theory, public space is democratic and accessible to all, but in practice, access depends in part on the regulatory regime of the space. Regulatory regimes are made up of a variety of practices, including laws, regulations, urban design, surveillance, and policing. My research explores the role of urban design in shaping how we experience the city. Over the past eight years, I've been researching what's commonly known as defensive or hostile urbanism. What began as research for my master's in urban planning at York University evolved into Defensive TO, a multimedia project that maps and documents the various forms of defensive urbanism. Taking Toronto as a starting point and expanding to other cities, my work aims to uncover hidden design strategies that are meant to exclude. Today, I'll introduce you to defensive urbanism, the forms it takes and how it's produced. Although it's a pervasive design strategy, it can be resisted through direct action, creative interventions, and political engagement. And by rejecting defensive urbanism, we can create more inclusive and accessible public spaces for everyone. So what is defensive urbanism? Also known as hostile, unpleasant, or inclusive design, it's an intentional, intentional design strategy that uses elements in the built environment to guide or restrict behavior in urban space. It's often used in conjunction with other forms of spatial regulation, such as park closures at night and laws that prohibit sleeping in public. Control is exerted through what designers Gordon Savicich and Selena Savage call silent agents. These are design elements that are meant to manage the behavior of people without the need for authorities to intervene. These silent agents can take many forms depending on the behavior they're designed to restrict. Common examples include benches segmented with center bars meant to keep unhoused people from lying down, spikes or protrusions that are installed on ledges to, de to deter skateboarding or sitting, and stark empty public spaces devoid of amenities like seating, shade, and public washrooms. People targeted are those who use or rely on public space the most, like people who are homeless and youth. And it does this by targeting behaviors they engage in, like sleeping in public and skateboarding. These behaviors are considered to be disorderly or undesirable because they deviate from intended uses of public space as envisioned by planners, designers, and property owners. There is an emerging interest in the study of defensive urbanism across disciplines such as urban studies, design, philosophy, and criminology. And while there's an increased interest in the topic, no clear definition currently exists to identify the design practice. Yet defensive urbanism can be found in many new and redeveloped places around the world. Although the practice is increasingly coming under scrutiny as hostile or exclusive, a lack of academic critique and empirical research means that it may be advocated as a best practice without an understanding of what kind of spaces are produced and how it affects marginalized community members. 
The variety of terms used to describe the design strategy reveals that there is a need to develop a coherent definition as a basis for further empirical research. In addition, terms like hostile or unpleasant don't adequately, adequately describe design features that are not inherently hostile or unpleasant, like planter boxes installed in alcoves to prevent people from panhandling or seeking refuge. I use the term defensive in my research because it captures how these design strategies are used to defend space against unwanted use. This can include the protection of property or the deterrence of unwanted behaviors. And although the terms defensive and hostile are relatively new, the use of the built environment for spatial control is not. But from fences and walls to gates and guard towers, there's a long history of architecture used to fortify cities and to keep people out. What is new is its widespread use in public spaces is also meant to be accessible and inclusive. Although per pervasive, it often goes unnoticed. While the most explicit examples demand attention, many forms of defensive urbanism are undetected by everyday users. And this is because its coercive functions are often hidden within more socially acceptable ones. For example, benches with a center bar still allow a person to sit. This can make it difficult to spot unless you're the one that is being designed against. The majority of defensive design interventions are meant to discipline bodies in space. So it requires an embodied approach to research. This means going out into a public space, spending time there and reflecting on how it makes you feel. Is it comfortable? Are there places to sit? Do you feel welcome? For Savicic and Savage, editors of the book, Unpleasant Design, their research looks for qualifiers that can help us to determine whether something is designed to be defensive. These qualifiers include shape modifications, surface treatments, and sensory interventions. In addition, defensive urbanism can be categorized according to its most common forms. This includes seating, surfaces, barriers, light, and sound. In the past, I've included forms of surveillance. While visible forms of surveillance like video cameras can influence behavior in urban space, it is not merely a design intervention. Security guards, property managers, and police can also engage in surveillance, which is part of the re larger regulatory regime of the space. So the most common form, as we can see so far, of defensive urbanism is modified seating. Benches adapted with a center bar are used to keep unhoused people from sleeping on them. While specially designed seating without backrest, like concrete slabs or large rocks, are meant to be uncomfortable enough to keep people from lingering for too long. Surfaces such as ledges or curbs can be adapted with metal spikes or protrusions to deter skateboarding, sitting, or lying down. And special paving, metal studs, rocks, or other objects can also be embedded into spaces such as doorways, sidewalks, or underpasses to prevent people from seeking refuge. Barriers can be temporary or permanent and are used to restrict access to urban space. Fences, rocks, plants, and other materials are commonly used to eliminate spaces of refuge and to block encampments from forming or returning. Fences have been used in cities like Toronto and LA to keep unhoused residents from setting up encampments in public space, but they're also commonly used to restrict access to alcoves, doorways, and laneways. Plants have long been used to restrict access to space. Uh, pretty recently in Portland, Oregon, about 80 rose bushes were planted by residents uh, of a neighborhood to prevent former encampment residents from returning to a space where they were seeking refuge. And even bicycle racks have been used in the city of Seattle. They were installed underneath a viaduct to prevent people from returning to a recently cleared encampment. Light can be used to increase visibility and safety in a space, 
but it can also be used as a deterrent depending on the light's brightness and quality. Uh, blue lights, although not really seen in uh, the projection right now, um, are increasingly installed in public washrooms, transit stations, and other publicly accessible spaces because they're thought to prevent intravenous drug users from finding a vein. And pink lights have been used in the UK to move along groups of young people because it amplifies the acne and resulting social discomfort of spotty-faced youth. Flashing lights are also increasingly used to move unhoused people along. A few years ago, in Toronto's Chinatown neighborhood, a new condo development installed bright flashing lights to move along unhoused people who use the space for years while it was under construction. When journalists began to call out the practice on social media, the lights were claimed to be malfunctioning and were removed. But years later, the condo entrance was redesigned to make sitting or sleeping in the entrance more difficult. From children's songs to classical music, sound has been used to keep people from sleeping in public or just hanging out. Classical music is commonly played in transit stations and even outside of storefronts as an attempt to move along perceived loiterers. In West Palm Beach, Florida, officials <laughs> a couple years ago uh, were playing extremely repetitive children's songs like Baby Shark as an attempt to keep unhoused people from hanging out at the waterfront and along a city-owned event venue. And in 2017, the Mosquito, an anti-loitering device that emits an irritating high-pitched noise at a frequency mostly young people in young years can hear, was spotted at downtown Toronto Park, located close to a nearby youth shelter. Although the device was removed after the story made media headlines, it's concerning that there's no policies in place to regulate its use. Defensive urbanism can be produced by a variety of actors, including governments and public institutions, the private sector, individual property, and individual property owners. And this can be done in a number of ways. First, existing infrastructure can be modified or specially designed so that pre-existing uses are no longer possible. Examples include seating designed for only one person or sloped in a way that leaning is the only option. Second, defensive design features can be added to a space to deter possible uses. The addition of objects like a center dividing bar on benches restricts physical use, while the addition of light or sound changes how a space is experienced. And finally, objects or public amenities can be removed from a space so that pre-existing functions disappear. And this is what I call ghost amenities. These are public amenities like benches and washrooms and water fountains that are often included in public spaces to make them more comfortable for humans, but are absent due to disrepair, reduced operation or intentional omission. And this is done as a way to reduce maintenance costs, avoid vandalism, and to, and to deter loitering. Although this spatial strategy is not discussed as much as the first two techniques, in many cases, it's easier to remove a feature than it is alter it or to construct something new. So defensive urbanism is a component of the design philosophy, crime prevention through environmental design, also known as SEPTEN. Influenced by Oscar Newman's 1970s work on defensible space and the, and the idea that the design of the built environment can prevent crime, SEPTED uses natural strategies for access control, surveillance, and territorial, territorial reinforcement to reduce real and perceived crime. SEPTED is largely disseminated by police departments and consultants who are often former policing and security professionals who approach the design of public space through a lens of enforcement. However, these design practices are based upon unquestioned and often unproven assumptions about crime and public safety. US-based design as protest collective calls for an end to SEPTED, arguing, quote, these efforts often criminalize blackness under the guise of safety, and the breaching of these efforts promotes unwarranted interaction with the police. 
the policing of minor crimes and so-called disorderly behavior is linked to George Kellen and James Wilson's broken windows thesis. It is believed, quote, that if a window in a building is broken and left unrepaired, all the rest of the windows will soon be broken. According to this line of thought, if small crimes and signs of disorder are left unattended or unpunished, more serious crime will flourish. While research has debunked this theory in recent years, these assumptions about crime and safety still inform zero tolerance policing practices and the design of the built environment. In addition, the securitization of public space is linked to entrepreneurial city strategies. According to critical geographer David Harvey, over the 1970s and 80s, many cities in North America and Western Europe transitioned from a managerial to entrepreneurial form of urban governance. The deindustrialization, suburban flight, and the dismantling of the Keynesian welfare state resulted in economic decline, widespread unemployment, and the physical deterioration of urban spaces. As cities attempted to boost their economies and encourage local development, they increasingly took on roles associated with the private sector, such as taking risks, embracing innovation, and engaging in place branding and promotion. Marked by interurban competition, public-private partnerships, and the political economy of place, the entrepreneurial city has created new spatial conditions that have implications for the production and management of public space. Entrepreneurial municipalities tend to invest in public space to improve the city's image, which is used in place branding and marketing. In order to protect these investments, public spaces are increasingly disciplined through surveillance, policing, and defensive urban design as a way to disperse unwanted people and to present the built environment as safe and controlled. Harvey argues, quote, above all, the city has to appear as an innovative, exciting, creative, and safe place to live or to visit, to play, and consume in. Defensive urbanism has become so normalized, it's even included in architectural renderings of future, future public spaces. This one size fits all solution to crime prevention and order maintenance means that defensive design features are often installed in new public spaces before any spatial conflicts arise. And in addition, many street furniture manufacturers offer an anti-vagrant option for benches, even if it's not named as such. This means in ordering new benches, the decision to include a center bar is as simple and uncontroversial as picking up the style and color. Since many municipalities lack regulations governing the use of defensive urbanism, its application can be arbitrary. Throughout my research, I've noticed some public spaces contain defensive design elements while others do not. And defensive urbanism strategies can be contradictory. There are elements like benches and picnic tables for fear of loiters, removes people from using the space. This is counterintuitive as many cities are undertaking placemaking projects to make public spaces more attractive or desirable. One would think that providing a welcoming place for people to sit, relax, and watch the world go by would be a central goal. Yet public spaces become less inviting when they feature defensive elements or lack basic public amenities. In addition, people are adaptable and can circumvent inflexible designs. Unhoused people can still sleep sitting up, skateboarders can skate around deterrents, and teenagers can ignore classical music meant to make them feel out of place. Although defensive urbanism targets so-called undesirable behaviors, such as sleeping in public or skateboarding, it also creates a hostile cityscape for everyone else. The absence of public amenities like washrooms, benches, and places of shelter and shade makes navigating public space difficult or impossible for people who are elderly, people with disabilities, and families with young children. The addition of elements like metal studs on ledges and center bars on benches creates additional barriers in the built environment that can be a hazard for people who are blind or have low vision. And sensory interventions like light and sound can also have unintended outcomes. 
Flashing lights used to move people along can trigger seizures in people who have epilepsy. And loud music used to move people along can be an unpleasant surprise and interfere with hearing aids for people who have hearing impairments. And what's more, accessibility is actually used to justify the use of defensive urbanism. Although people with disabilities and accessibility advocates are quick to point out that inflexible designs create more barriers for people to navigate. A few years ago, I wrote about defensive benches stenciled with the COVID-19 time limit that were installed and then removed in Montreal's Cabot Square. Images of the bright blue benches segmented with center bars created a backlash on social media, prompting Mayor Valerie Plant to respond, quote, the bench has no place in the vicinity of Cabot Square because it contributes to the stigmatization of homelessness. But when questioned, a Montreal city spokesperson revealed that there were no plans to do away with similarly designed benches around Cabot Square or elsewhere because, quote, this type of bench is also in place for universal accessibility purposes in order to accommodate people with reduced mobility, such as elderly people who require an armrest to sit down or to get up. And I received a similar response when I reached out to a City of Toronto spokesperson questioning the purpose of the center bars. They revealed, quote, for some people with disabilities and seniors, two armrests will significantly enhance accessibility and support the person transferring into or out of the seat using both arms for support. While this may be the case, if concerns over accessibility were genuine, other accessibility requirements would be met, like ensuring that access to the bench is provided through a barrier <laughs> three path, uh, including backrests for additional support would be helpful, and making sure that extra space is included in and around the bench to accommodate mobility devices and service animals. Another consideration is defining exactly what counts as an armrest. According to accessibility specialist Thea Curdy, armrests that are not 150 to 300 millimeters above the height of the seat may not actually offer the support that they are meant to provide. And if armrests are too low, they can be a barrier to accessibility, especially if they're not color contrasted and people accidentally sit on them. As we can see, it's possible to use accessibility in bad faith. In the case of the armrest, it has been weaponized against other groups. Liv Mendelson, Director of Accessibility and Inclusion at the Miles Nadell Jewish Community Center in Toronto explained in an interview, quote, using the language of accessibility to forward exclusionary design is a kind of access washing. It's especially appalling when you consider people who are homeless are more likely to have disabilities. And all over the world, people are standing up to exclusionary design practices through direct action and creative intervention. In 2018, in the UK, activists were spotted removing anti-homeless bars on benches in the town of And in 2021, in Boston, Massachusetts, a group calling themselves Schlubs for Housing removed center bars on benches in the city's transit system. In a statement on, on Twitter, they write, quote, anti-homeless architecture is cruel and violent. In solidarity with the unhoused communities of Cambridge and Boston, we have taken action to remove the hostile architecture from the MBTA. In addition, social media can play a role in raising awareness and advocating for change. Since 2018, dozens of social media accounts have been created to document defensive urbanism in cities around the world. And art can also be a powerful tool for constant consciousness raising. In 2005, part protest piece, oh, sorry, in 2005, American artist Sarah Ross created Arca suits, four leisure jogging suits fashioned to adapt to defensively designed structures in LA. Every now and then her work goes viral on social media, re-exposing the project to new audiences. And part installation, part protest piece, German designer Fabian Brussing created his pay and sit bench in 2008. The bench covered with spikes retracts when someone inserts a 50 cent coin. After a period of time, the buzzer goes off and spikes rise again. 
The project is so provocative and successful that people think this is actually an example of defensive urbanism. And in 2018, UK artist Stuart Semple created design crime stickers, which can be purchased from his site and used to stick on examples of hostile design. In recent years, public pressure has led to some jurisdictions to debate regulation and prohibition of the use of defensive urbanism. This past February, in the state of Connecticut, House Bill 6400, which would ban hostile architecture in Connecticut's public spaces, had a public hearing in the Planning and Development Committee. And in Brazil, a law nicknamed Julio Lancelotti, named after a famous Sao Paulo priest, was introduced in November 2022, prohibiting the installation of stakes and stones to deter rough sleeping. The priest became famous after a video of him breaking up anti-homeless architecture went viral in 2021. While the law was passed by the House and the Senate, it appears it was vetoed by President Bolsonaro before the end of his time in office. To wrap up, defensive urbanism is everywhere. It's become a best practice in the planning and design of public spaces in cities that seek to create safe and controlled environments conducive for capital investment. Assumptions about who belongs in public spaces and who does not renders some people out of place. When we use design to address social issues like substance use, mental illness, and homelessness, it merely displaces the problem rather than confronting it. This displacement further marginalizes the city's most vulnerable and makes them invisible. This creates a distorted version of the city free of poverty and social discomfort. And this is a problem because it is through our encounters of difference and experiencing the other that we learn different values and forms of expression. In addition, designing flexibility into public space and amenities is increasingly important for cities like Toronto which is struggling to create and maintain enough public space for its booming population. Rather than creating single use spaces and street furniture, we should be finding ways to make the most of our limited resources by designing multifunctional public spaces and amenities. In order to create a truly inclusive and diverse city, we must not shy away from difference in our public spaces. Everyone deserves to have a place in their city and everyone should have a right to access the benefits of public space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. I think some of you are doing a very workshop. So you can sit comfortably, but upright. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's see our laptop around for our friends on Zoom. And we have a little bit of time for questions. Stop set up here. And if there are questions on Zoom as well, I'm just going to pop up the chat. Josiane? So when you showed us, uh, I think you said this, the old you showed us a map. Is this like an uh, interactive map that people can use? And Know more about that, where like, um, absolutely, okay. Like, yeah, I'm new, um, like met with the back room as a technical, but there are such maps where, like, uh, open classrooms or public classrooms, and if you notice, both of your maps, it would be like so great to show people who are out there. Um, but if people have submissions, uh, they can just email me, uh, defensiveto at gmail.com or check out the website. Just a follow-up question on that. In terms of, did you see there, there was a difference? Um, because you mentioned, uh, obviously, uh, there are differences in terms of it being enforced, mm -hmm. um, not consistently. Um, and therefore, I was wondering in neighborhoods that were predominantly uh, red light neighborhoods, neighborhoods that were predominantly black, neighborhoods that were predominantly more uh, seen as uh, hostile neighborhoods generally by the public, um, is such public architecture 
less and uh, hostile architecture less enforced in those spaces? Is that already perceived as hostile? Or are they more enforced as a way to deter that plan? Were mm -hmm. you seeing pockets of hostile architecture in the city apart from the downtown that you were able to map out? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, that, that might be the case, but through my research, um, yeah, it's, it's not only in downtown, it's, it's in suburbs, it's in small towns. Um, they're in new and redeveloped public spaces. They're not really in older public spaces. Um, and uh, they're, they're most often in spaces of high circulation, like uh, streets and transit stations, um, but also in spaces like commercial and tourist districts. Um, I, I think that the lack of amenities is huge in, in uh, um, racialized communities, poor communities. Um, so, so, you know, that, that would be the case. But the, the installation of new stuff, uh, I, I see mostly in places where they want to keep spaces controlled and um, I guess, uh, you know, free from poverty or, or any sort of disruption to uh, consumption. Have you ever taken part in research action projects? Like where you get set with the spaces that we're talking about, and you say that some from the integrated. Um, I've 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 led uh, mapping of, of defensive architecture, but I haven't um uh created any sort of um like embodied project. If, if maybe that's so as I know to work with a collective that tested places mm -hmm. uh, where they were kind of seemingly uninvited mm -hmm. and afterwards they wrote the book. But this was such short short years because uh, it could end up in like um applications with the police right away. So it's like we're researching creating and um testing places, but this is like too much to handle, right? Mm -hmm. so I think this could be a great solution, but it's so hard to actually like, try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I guess anytime I'm in the city, I'm in a public space, I, you know, I go into it and, you know, not only do I walk through and, and sit and, and spend some time there, uh, like I'll sit on the benches, <laughs> and I'll, you know, and, and that's, that, that's how I know, like some designs that look fine, like uh, the benches with the slats that have spaces in between them. It, it's meant, I believe it's meant to deter skateboarding. It's supposed to catch the wheels in it. But when you sit on it, it just is so uncomfortable because your your flesh goes through <laughs> into the gaps and it's, it's you know, so uh, actually testing out these spaces and these amenities is hugely important because it might look nice, but it's it's not meant to be comfortable at all. And what's the ultimate, this, I'm maybe one of the only designers in the room, but what is the ultimate goal of Defense Bar? I mean, is, is the idea that once the research is completed that you are able to have a seat in policymakers' rooms or, there's, there's always with this kind of work, there's an assumed politic of design. There's an, mm -hmm. there's an assumption that every designer wants to create something that's not hostile, which just isn't true. You know, the assumed assumption that design sits outside of the neoliberal draconian way of thought is always intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, you know, it, it's amazing how many people actually still don't know that this is an intentional design strategy. People think it's an accident oh. that spaces are created to be, uh, you know, lacking a washroom or lacking benches, but it, it, it's, it's very intentional. Um, and I guess I just like my, my work right now is just to highlight, um, to raise awareness of what's going on, to try to create some policy change. Um, but I'm, Throughout my PhD, I'm also uh, looking to interview users, uh, marginalized users of public space to get how, get, get their impression of how it affects them. Uh, surprisingly, there's not really much research out there, uh, you know, asking people who are unhoused how these designs 
uh, affect their their safety, their well being, their health. Um, you know, there, there's not much research on uh, elderly people. Like, do they really use both center bars to push themselves off of a bench? Because I've never seen anyone do that before. Um, so it, it's really about um, diving in deeply uh, and, and looking at what the discourse is, because it, it's it's very much not only uh, is the center bar um, premises an accessibility measure. But also there's this idea that you don't want a single group to dominate a public space because it's not accessible. Um, so it's about questioning these kind of assumptions, questioning assumptions about crime and safety. Um, and, and actually like defensive urbanism is talked about separately than SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, but it's actually a component of it. And that's what I want to also emphasize is that, uh, you know, Accepted practitioners who are looking to, you know, not not all practices are unsafe um, or, or, or not desirable because we do need light in public spaces for people at night. Um, but it, it's really the over fortification kind of aspect of septed that uh, this emerges. And so um, I hope that answers some of your questions. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask a question? Um, I think this is a question for both of you, but I think it also leads off a little bit of Nivet's question too. And um, Jean, I know like your work has been more concentrated on, on sleep, but I was really struck by that moment where you um, were mentioning like Brianna Taylor, um, but this idea of uh, state murders in the bedroom basically, and that kind of vulnerability. And this project has full of black women and the desire to pull a curtain across a certain experience of sleep, which is still collective, but not necessarily public. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we conceive these spaces, like the inadequacy for me, one of the things that come up with sleep is the inadequacy of public private as a, a useful uh, epistemological category for understanding what sleep is and what sleep does but also the way that the common, which really emerged, particularly in the wake of things like the Occupy movement, I'm also not convinced by that as the space for analysis. And I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit on the nature of collective, common, the public, both private, Nivez example showing the kind of difference of what constitutes public space or, or the, the abandonment or private, the, yeah, the abandonment of collective spaces such as neighborhoods, which are, are, are left out of certain forms of, of uh, this course, but I don't know if that question makes sense, but. Yeah, I mean, it's a really big question. I mean, it, it's, I think in a way it um, it makes me think of, you're right, that division between public and private is not really adequate. It, it's so specific to particular contexts. Um, you know, there are other places where the division is very different, right? Where these categories mean different things. But um, I'm just struck that, you know, I think in the case of um, you know, what you're talking about, Kara, it's sleep in public is in itself disorderly. I mean, that is very specifically one of the behaviors that is trying to be discouraged. It's the, the body lying down that cannot be tolerated, mm -hmm. um, whereas the upright seated body can be countenance in that space for you know, maybe a fixed period of time. So there, that distinction in a way, it's um, kind of reified in law and policy, in, in policy perhaps. Um, yeah, why is that? Um, sleep is not, there's nothing criminal about it in itself, but something about sleeping in public becomes associated with um, criminality. And this goes back to, you know, vagrancy laws that were instituted in period the period of um, after reconstruction um, to um, you know social stigma uh, against the unhoused population, but yeah, that, that's really fascinating. Something that is perfectly like, normal and neutral becomes um, undesirable mm -hmm. when it's done in you know, certain places, and, you know, as you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't. Just going to these other examples of the sleeping commons, um, I think for anyone who lives most of their life in, you know, let's say 
like for us in North America, where there is a certain kind of, um, you know, we are all like embedded in these architectures, not just public architectures, but domestic architectures, um, which encode certain assumptions, techniques of the body, let's say, using Marcel Mauss's terms. Um, it, it really kind of shapes and codes and builds in certain assumptions about how behaviors are performed, where, where they're done. And I, I think that kind of association of sleep with privacy, domesticity, there's a kind of a whole set of normative assumptions about the right way to sleep, um, which are you know both spatial and temporal. I mean, the idea that you know, we should probably sleep for one continuous stretch of roughly eight hours. That is in itself a uh, historical development. It's encoded in the labor slogan, you know, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours to do what we please. But even that itself is a kind of a discipline of sleep, right? These infrastructures of discipline are everywhere. And I think, um, what is so powerful about some of these, um, you know, protests, demonstrations, occupations that involve moving the act of sleep away from its typical place into somewhere where we don't expect to encounter it in a kind of collective situation, it, it is a very powerful statement. It, it, it is like the basic idea of a demonstration gathering that is being, um, you know, embodied there. Um, and maybe it is more radical if people are, you know, lying down rather than, again, to go back to the kind of, you know, familiar iconography, rising up, standing up, mobilizing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's important to think of, um, you know, mass protests and demonstration as um, including both of these aspects. Um, but, but, but yeah, I think sometimes the claims that, you know, the mere act of putting the body outside, that, that already there is a, an appeal to, you know, what is shared, a kind of universal, universal vulnerability. And I think that really does need to be questioned. And that's, to me, is the important lesson of a project like Black and Dream. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question or if you have yeah. any other thoughts on that. No, no, it's it's a it's a thick and, and complicated question, but I think one of the things that it really points to is the idea that uh, politics of sleep means sleep is never isolated, whether it's collective or not, because it's always about what other forms of life it attaches to. And it seems to me that's part of the provocation of public sleeping. But the way we were connecting it to questions of accessibility, and your question, Josiane, about bathrooms too, it, it just makes me think about what are those other things associated with domesticity, like breastfeeding in public, for example, mm -hmm. all of these unruly forms of life and what kind of accommodations they would require that aren't universal, that might be tailored to specific bodies or bodies in specific states, um, but thinking about what that would look like as a, the, in, in terms of the social force of design, basically. Um, I don't know if there's questions on. Uh, Oh, sorry, Zoom audience cannot hear the question. Sorry about that, Zoom audience. Um, does anyone on Zoom have a question, by the way? And does anyone else here have a question? Mm -hmm. I just, I'm curious about the actionability of um, your project. Like, is hostile architecture something that can be like actionable against aside from um, like the the design suits that we were looking at, um, is is there like a a direct action that follows um, the project that you're working on, or is it more about um, raising awareness? Uh, well, so, let me repeat the question for the audience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the the question was, is there an action coming out of the the project? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um. I've thought about <laughs> some, uh, but right now uh, I'm, I'm pursuing my PhD. So mm -hmm. I'm focusing uh, on, on doing my research uh, mm -hmm. around it. Um, at this point, it, I, I'm just kind of uh, trying to uh, add more submissions to the map and, and kind of see what kind of analysis I can also derive out of that at the moment. But uh, there's plenty of, 
ideas for direct action. If you Google it on the internet, um, you know, there's people that remove center bars on benches. There, uh, in the UK, there was a group of people that were pouring cement over concrete spikes um, or placing mattresses on top of spikes on windowsills. Um, I know in Toronto, there was a group called Sitio uh, where they just placed chairs in public spaces uh, to raise awareness over the lack of seating. Uh, so there's there's many interesting things uh, that can be done and, and that are being done, uh, if anyone's interested in checking that out. Is it a concern to you that it's all the grassroots? Because it would be it's concerning to me as a designer that there's there's there seems to be no impetus for top-down level addressing of such things and that it's all grassroots. Well, you know, there yeah, it is grassroots pressure that is um starting to create change. There, there are petitions that are out um, leading to it being debated in, in you know, part and like different assemblies and, and uh, some jurisdictions actually looking to ban it. Um, but I do also find it concerning that it's hard to find people to speak about the practice mm -hmm. who are planners and designers. Um, and often when it does happen, there's just, I, I feel like, there's a lot of perception that it's this practical approach to alleviating conflict in public space, but there's not much looking into the deeper aspects of how uh, it, it displaces people and, and further criminalizes people. Um, so I, I, I think, but, but there are also um, organizations such as, uh, I think they're called the Space Coalition. They were a group of landscape architects that came together after the George Floyd murder uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, they were asking for um, professional, their professional body to uh, start implementing changes in how they do their practice. So the, the grassroots movement is coming into the professional setting as well. Um, and and we'll, see, we'll see what happens through there, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think depending on how you define actionable, whether it is targeted towards um, private developers mm -hmm. who are, you know, installing some of these hostile measures or um, public servants like the mayor, that the strategies and, you know, potential outcomes, I think, would be really different. Mm -hmm. And it makes me curious about um, what about the people in the neighborhood? What if we think of them as a constituency? I mean, I, I wonder about the people actually living in the condominium or you know, near the condominium that installed the flashing lights to um, discourage and house people from gathering. Um, you know, what what if they were brought into the conversation? That could be really interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. And and one thing that I do want to note is not just planners and designers and corporations and governments that are are installing these things into places. It's also unfortunately community members that are putting rocks underneath underpasses in their neighborhood because they don't want encampments there. Um, so I think that, yeah, dialogue definitely needs to happen and there needs to be ways to figure out, you know, how to get people the services and uh, the care that they need rather than just using, <laughs> you know, these tools to move them out of place. Yeah. Any last questions, Alex? Yeah, I, I, it's a comment, a comment slash question to both of you, but it, it kind of um, uh, the question has to do with the intersection between design issues and the in public sleep, um, uh, along with sort of questions of sleep as uh, uh, questions of disability of sleep or disorders of sleep or people who need to sleep because they, for example for various reasons, mm -hmm. um, and whether um, sort of the association of sleep with vagrancy or with laziness or, with, or something that's undesirable or what would be unhoused is at the same time sort of limiting the way that that, um, that uh, public spaces are acknowledging or building or designing for 
these types, these types of issues. So for example, you would be hesitant to design for um, so for example, mapping spaces in public uh, to accommodate certain um, populations because you worry that it would be misused in quotation marks uh, by the in-house. So it's not we I mean, I don't know if you thought these things of how they might how they overlap and cross over or don't or don't. Um, but sort of the the needs might be the same, but because they're different populations, um, they're different, they're also different kinds of uh, um, discourses attached to them and different types of just different different uh, people might be fighting fighting for these things as well. But also these might be looking for similar types of solutions in the public space. Mm -hmm. Just to repeat the question about just the overlap between particularly disability uh, and uh, the use of public space and the kind of common grounds, um, but also maybe the different ways that uh, the same use might be conceived by. I mean, I think it all goes back to the Combahee River Collective and the invention of intersectionality as a kind of metric, but um, yeah. I think I'm going to mention about. It's a comment. I don't think I have the question necessarily, but. Fair enough. Um, well, your comment um, made me think about how I started to notice, you know, the benches with the center bars. I, I was in a park one day and I was wanting to lie down on the bench to read a book, um, but she can't. <laughs> Uh, um, but but it's also interesting because, you know, if I were lying on a bench reading a book, um, you know, no one would be calling the police on me, uh, you know, because I'm a middle-aged white woman, <laughs> you know, versus uh, someone who's unhoused. We would definitely have that scrutiny. So, um, it, you know, obviously it's not just about sleeping in public, but it's also who sleeps in public. Um, as, as you also mentioned, uh, about uh, unfortunately that woman who was uh, arrested arrested in her dorm mm -hmm. uh, for being black interrogated. Mm -hmm. I was curious about that. Why was she interrogated? Like, what were the grounds or the suspicion imputed for her? Apparently, somebody else in the dorm saw her sleeping there, um, called the police, who came and then questioned her on to be in that space. So if, if you Google um, her name, I think you really have seen Lola, mm -hmm. there are um, news reports of this incident. Was it, it was at Yale yeah. University. Okay. Thank you. I was really confused as to why she would be questioned for taking a nap, I think, because it was reported. Yeah. Was it assumed that she was in the house? Like, it was this kind of assumption that she was supposed to be there to begin with? It was, a, I think it was an assumption that she did not have a right to that space, did not belong there because she was Black. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's about where, where one is sleeping, but then also who, who is a sleeper mm -hmm. that changes the whole assessment of that. It's crazy. like they've clearly never seen someone pulling an all nighter because it's like such a messy process. I feel like everyone is completely undone in those situations where your stuff might be all over a desk, but like that says a lot about um, like a, a lack of context for those situations where someone would report her for for just being there. All she's doing is studying. Have you been to America? <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely racist. Um, there's always a common un under assumption as to what racism can do, and I'm always awed by it in, uh, in conversations. As I can't remember the name, I don't live here, but um, I never, being British and being Asian, so I'm from Pakistan, not really knowing what racism was till I moved to America, really understanding what racism is. Mm. And this, uh, this lack of logical thinking as to why someone would be, would be subjected to such a thing when simply because she was black. I'm still amazed and horrified by that notion that's mm -hmm. acceptable. 
yeah, when being a student is all about falling asleep at random times yeah. in strange places, you know, in dorms and libraries, um, various campus spaces, um, and also at a time when I think, you know, awareness of um, sleep deprivation and its tolls on the student body is probably higher than ever. And so many schools are, as I mentioned, taking me measures to try to encourage students to get proper rest. And yet this happens, um, you know, in the midst of this kind of, uh, you know, massive concern for student wellness. I think it also goes back to your point that we were talking about in class, but also a little bit today, which is in the American context, the rooting of um, measures of sleep control in plantation practices. And the idea that the black body is not a body that deserves rest, right? So the long-standing racist associations with laziness and things like that, but also the, the fact that student bodies are ambiguously positioned as workers as well. And so the kind of, again, this kind of confluence of, of different identities around the specific vulnerabilities of daring to rest in not even a public space at that point, like her own, her own privatized space, but that even the private space, again, that public private distinction is not, it's not operative in the same way. Mm -hmm. Theories about how different groups sleep or don't sleep are an important part of the history of racialization, eugenics, racial difference. Um, and yeah, uh, I mentioned the article on the rest notes by Josie Rowan Holler, and she calls this mm -hmm. the myth of black insomnia, which I think we can see operating in all of these contexts. Is Josie at Yale? I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks for our people for joining us. So please join me in thanking our speakers one last time. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, our next sleep salon is, I'm not sure when, next month. It's on our website. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs>